Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the third annual Synapse Roundtable. My name is Michael Gralia. I am the Managing Director of the Syngap Research Fund. And it is such a thrill to welcome our incredible speaker here today. One of my favorite SAV members, Ellie Brimble from Citizen, is um, just one of my favorite people. And I will let her talk about Citizen and thank her in advance for all of her good work for all of our kids. Go ahead, Ellie. Oh, well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, let me get set up. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yep. Perfect. Um, so thank you very kindly for the introduction and for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm going to be sharing some information on behalf of Citizen, which is now part of the larger Invite family. And so to start off with an introduction to Citizen, this is a patient mediated platform. So patient centric, patient focused, and it really allows participants to collect and store their medical records. And then what we do with those medical records once they've been collected is transform those into research ready data sets. So the goal is to make these computable, digital and relevant so that they can be shared at the user's discretion um, in order to support research and clinical programs. The FDA has recently come out with guidance around the collection of real world data. And so we've worked to ensure that the way we approach data collection is consistent um, and of high quality. And one of the ways that we've sought to approach this is by taking um, a framework that includes two different levels. So our topmost level we refer to as the disease model which essentially serves as the conceptual foundation for the data products on the citizen platform. And so what the model is doing is it's defining in advance what types of data is extracted, ensuring that information is relevant and important to the conditions on the platform. And then it also establishes relationships between those different types of data. So rather than just having kind of a linear um, outline of various symptoms and procedures and interventions, we're able to create a network of information describing how things are connected to one another. Within the disease model, we have also built out a manually curated ontology. Um, and the intention of the ontology is to be able to harmonize and normalize the information that's collected. So we can essentially think of this as a really large data dictionary ensuring that each term or each piece of data that we collect from medical records is assigned a standard way to talk about it. So we all know that many of the many individuals who have a rare diagnosis are followed by many different providers. And so what this allows is even if providers and doctors are talking about the same types of symptoms in different ways, we're able to normalize across that variation. We've been incredibly lucky to work with some fantastic organizations, including two that are represented here today. And so what I wanted to take an opportunity to do was share some of the data that we've collected um, in order to encourage collaboration and further use of this data. So by the end of the year, we expect to have complete data for 70 individuals with STXBP1 and 105 individuals with Syngap1. In order to illustrate the range of data that we collect from longitudinal medical records, um, we've randomly selected 50 individuals from each cohort, and I'm going to be sharing some data with you for those individuals. To start with, here are some characteristics of the 100 participants in, spread across STXBP1 and SYNGAP1. On the left-hand side here, we're looking at the distribution of males and females. And so we can see that it's a roughly equal distribution for both populations. And then these um, two graphs here are showing the distribution of age, whether that's age today or age at diagnosis. And so we did not see any significant difference between the two cohorts in terms of age today or at age of diagnosis. And we can see the averages here are relatively close to each other. One of the things we pride ourselves on at Citizen is our 
somewhat ruthless approach to collecting medical records, we do our best to ensure that we are fully capturing the um, patient's interaction with the healthcare system, whether that's at one institution or at multiple institutions. And so I wanted to share some information around the medical records that we collect to give you a sense of the breadth and scope of data. So comparing STXBP1 to Syngap, when we look at the number of institutions that we've collected medical records from, for Syngap, this is about six institutions. Oh, my apologies. For STXBP1, this is about six institutions. And for Syngap, it's about five. But you can see that it ranges all the way up to 17 or 18. In terms of the number of indiv individual documents, so these represent individual clinic notes, imaging reports, labs, lab reports. Um, for STXBP1, we were looking at an average of 212 documents per patient, corresponding with about 750 pages. And for Syngap, it was slightly less, about 175 documents, corresponding with approximately 650 pages of information. But again, you can see that there is a wide range of um, volume of data, in many cases dependent on the presentation of the individual. So as I mentioned in our introduction slides, we have a disease model which defines um, different types of information that we collect. And one of the broader categories of data we refer to as clinical diagnosis, but it's really meant to capture any diagnoses, phenotypes, signs, or symptoms that a patient may experience. And so one of the exercises that we did to get a sense more broadly um, for the diagnoses of individuals with either STXBP1 or Syngap um, is we took those unique diagnoses and mapped those back to a broader organ system. And this is one of the benefits of using a standard terminology, which allows that propagation um, in a somewhat automated fashion. And so what I'm showing you in the graph here, in the light green color, we see STXBP1, and then in this tealy, bluey, greeny color, we see Syngap. And we're showing the number of unique diagnoses mapped to each organ system across those cohorts. So for example, looking at the neurology bars at the very top of the graph, we see that there were 408 unique diagnoses spread across the, um, or counted across the population um, compared to 327 in Syngap. And so unsurprisingly, we see that some of the more commonly affected organ systems um, or broader categories of systems are neurology, neuropsych, which we've included some behavioral diagnoses as well, musculoskeletal, GI, and eye. And so this is certainly consistent with what's been presented here today as well. We can also dive in. So, you know, first we talked about diagnoses more broadly, but we can also narrow in to focus on more specific diagnoses. And so here I've pulled some diagnoses that are relevant to um, either one or the other or both of the conditions presented here today. And so we can look here at the frequency of epilepsy, any developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, any movement disorder phenotype, an autism diagnosis or behavioral challenges. And so already here, we can start to see some differences in the phenotypic spectrum of these two conditions. So in STXBP1, we see that we're observing a higher frequency of developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, as well as movement disorder. Whereas looking at Syngap, there appears to be a higher frequency of autism diagnoses and behavioral challenges. So we can certainly do this across the full spectrum of diagnoses that are extracted to start to tease apart some unique differences between various conditions. One of the important um, approaches to data extraction that we take is every unique data point is assigned a date. And so this allows us to characterize the phenotype across an individual's lifespan. And so one way I wanted to highlight that today was to talk about the presenting diagnosis or symptom in both um, STXBP1 and Syngap1. And so when we look at um, STXBP1, 
we can see that there is um, kind of a, a very striking presentation where epilepsy is certainly the most common presenting feature. Whereas comparing that to Syngap, we see um, a little bit more variability in what might be the presenting symptom. But we do see a spectrum here with some overlap where epilepsy and seizures, delays, and hypotonia are common amongst the two conditions. Um, whereas Syngap, we see reflux as one of the more common presenting features, as well as feeding difficulty with plagiocephaly and respiratory distress in the STXBP1. We also looked to see whether there were any differences between the age at onset. Um, so how old were individuals when they were first reported to have a diagnosis or symptom? And we do see that individuals with STXBP1 present significantly earlier than those with Syngap1 um, for an average of 5.2 months compared to 11.1 months. I also wanted to look to see whether there were any differences in the time to diagnosis. So what this graph is showing us is based on when the patient first presented, how many months did it then take for them to achieve their diagnosis of either STXBP1 or Syngap1? And so we didn't see any significant differences between the two with the average time to diagnosis for an individual with Syngap at 60 months. Um, and then the average, the average time to diagnosis for an individual with STXBP1 was around 59 months. I wanted to get a sense of whether the specific presenting diagnosis impacted that duration. And so we broke the presenting features out into epilepsy versus all other diagnoses. And while we do see that it appears those with epilepsy did achieve um, diagnosis earlier than those where the presenting symptom was not epilepsy, this didn't achieve statistical significance. We can also dig into um, specific phenotypes. So we know for both Syngap1 and STXBP1 that epilepsy and seizures are an important clinical endpoint to characterize. And so looking at the age of epilepsy onset, we do see a difference in age of onset. Um, so looking at the graph here at the top, we broke out age of epilepsy or seizure onset into neonatal, so presenting within the first month of life, infantile onset, presenting in the first year of life, and then childhood onset, which would be after the first year of life. And we can see that there is a striking difference between STXBP1 and Syngap, where the majority of individuals with STXBP1 have seizure onset within the first year of life, whereas this is really a minority of patients with Syngap1 and epilepsy, where we see that those individuals are presenting um, in childhood. And we can also see that the age of onset of epilepsy was statistically different between STXBP1 and Syngap, where again, we're seeing that individuals with STXBP1 have seizure onset much earlier in life. We also pull out information related to medication use and the duration of medication use. So here I'm showing an example specific to anti-seizure medications. And so we're looking here at the most commonly tried anti-seizure medications in STXBP1 and Syngap. And so we can see that there are some un um, unsurprising names here. We have Keppra, Phenobarbital, Onfi, Topamax, and ACTH in STXBP1. And then for Syngap, we see Keppra as the most common, followed by Onfi, um, Lamictal, Valproate, and Episuximide. We also see that in both cohorts, people are trying a lot of different anti-seizure medications. So on average in STXBP1, we're seeing people are trying around five different anti-seizure medications ranging from one to 16. Um, and in Syngap, this is about six different anti-seizure medications ranging from one to 18. We can also take a look at how long medications were used. So even though some medications may be tried more frequently, we wanted to try to get a sense of whether or not um, some medications were felt to be more effective than others, 
And one of the ways we wanted to try to approximate that was by looking at the duration the patient was on that medication. So in these graphs, we're looking at the duration of medication use normalized to the duration of epilepsy, and we see some differences here. So in STXBP1, we see a couple new medications that were not necessarily the most commonly prescribed, but they did appear to be used for um, a longer duration compared to the, the full number of different seizure medications that were employed. And the same here with Syngap1. And one thing that's interesting with Syngap is if you'll recall from the previous slide, Keppra or Levothyrosetam was the most commonly tried medication. But here we're seeing that it's not one of the medications that was um, used for the longest duration. So this is an interesting approach that we could take to try to understand whether or not certain medications or combinations of medications are felt to be effective by the treating team. And then for the last couple of slides, I wanted to talk about data access. Um, one of the themes of this meeting today is collaboration. And so we sure, certainly want to make sure that um, those interested in these conditions know how to access the data we're collecting. Um, so all of the citizen data collected uh, is done so under a broad consent, which has received a determination of exemption through category seven. And so in order to access citizen data to support academic research, we simply require the following, um, a study protocol outlining the use of citizen data that has achieved a determination of exemption through category eight, which we are happy to assist with, as well as a signed research agreement. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to research at citizen.com and we'll be happy to support you. And then I did also wanna just make a plug that we are working to connect patient data across other platforms through common identifiers um, with Simon Searchlight being one of the examples where this has been very successful. And so really what we're trying to do is to prevent data from being siloed in different places. And so our goal is really to be able to connect data that lives across various platforms to create a really rich research data set that can be used to accelerate clinical um, programs in these conditions. So, you know, one of the exciting things about now being part of the Invite family is we're hoping to be able to add genetic data, um, whether that's the specific genetic variant, um, causative for a person's diagnosis or whole genome sequencing, for example, we're now going to be able to layer that onto the longitudinal clinical data that we extract at Citizen, whether that's any patient-generated health data, biospecimens, um, and we have also successfully connected to individual patient registries as well. So this is part of a larger effort amongst many groups to ensure that data can be connected across various platforms where an individual patient may be um, participating in. Uh, and this is just a plug. If you're here at AES, we do have a poster with some more SunGap data. Um, so feel free to come by to say hello. Uh, I'll be standing by the poster tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. And Ellie, I think we have one question in the Q&A panel. Oh, that's a great question. And I may recruit Dr. Chung to help answer this as well. Um, I can speak for the citizen data. We are focusing primarily on extraction of medical record data. So um, taking the information that lives in the existing medical record from each time you visit a physician or provider and transforming that into a normalized data set. Um, and we are working to be able to share data between um, the Simon Searchlight program as well. And if you'd like to add to that, Dr. Yep. Chen, so, so as Ellie said, we're very complimentary in terms of we're really family facing um, to be able to make sure we get that perspective and uh, get very granular data in terms of these annual evaluations. So the two are very much complementary in terms of that. And so we've really striven to be able to make sure, as Ellie said, that we're not siloed and that you can put the pieces together um, to be able to get the most out of the combined data sets. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ellie. Um, uh, I think it's just so exciting that we're really starting to build up 
data sets for these rare neurodevelopmental disorders. And as Ellie said, bringing together and integrating that data um, is critical for us to be able to extend our understanding and leverage um, the work that's happened to gather that data. So thank you.